All right. Good morning. Good morning. First of all, I want to applaud you all for getting up dark and early to be here with us this morning. And I know some of you hung out last night, as did I. <laughs> Full transparency. Um, and I ventured out to the old village inn. And yeah, I lost my voice a little bit. Um, and the reason why I wanted to go there is because the village inn is now the first and only black owned business on Mackinac Island. So before you leave, check it out. I want to thank Margaret Trimmer and Delta Dental for sponsoring this important conversation. And we all know that it's an old conversation, right? Definitely. In fact, we've had certain versions already uh, here at the Mackinac Policy Conference. But what we're doing this morning is looking at it through a different lens, right? So we want to look at it through a lens of diversity, equity, inclusion, social justice, and sustainability in order to lift up underrepresented businesses. So with that, we want to look at it also with a sense of urgency and also um, look at how we can make a difference when it comes to lifting up these businesses. So we're going to start off by going around the horn and with Candace looking at it from a high level national view, Brian, a statewide view, and then Hiram from the Detroit perspective. So Candace, what are you seeing nationally and what about the impact of the pandemic on these businesses? Sure, good morning, thanks so much. So I'll, I'll talk about it from a black business perspective nationally. So just as the pandemic was starting last year, 40% of black businesses started to close, February, March, April. Like that's a lot of companies closing kind of all at once. And that happened because of the wealth gap. They didn't have enough money to stay open. They didn't have any leverage to get those companies to stay open. And so at that point, kind of pre-pandemic, we were already at risk, right, of closing. There were distressed businesses already and that rate of distress was about 60% compared to our white counterparts at risk at about a rate of about 30%. So a huge, huge difference. We get through the pandemic, we're kind of like going through rescue plan and kind of PPP and all of those things. And the rate of success for a white owned business was around 60% of getting funding from PPP, a little less than 30% for black owned businesses. So it was just a kind of a really huge disparity between the two. And yes, we've all been talking about let's start businesses, let's make this happen. I think that's just a lot of talk because the money isn't there to make it happen. Wow. Brian, what are you seeing? The pandemic had an exaggerated impact on those that already faced major challenges. And so when all the things that were true pre-pandemic were true to a larger extent after the pandemic. And uh, what it really revealed, a couple of things actually that, uh, that I, I think we can take away from this is that first of all, with, when it comes to smaller businesses, there's not a good way to know who made it and who didn't. You know, small business close, closes, they usually quietly close their door. There's no press release, there's no announcement, there's no filing. And so uh, people's lives are ruined and the door closes. And uh, other than the ones right in that community, um, nobody really knows about it. So I think that the, from a statistical standpoint, this pandemic and the severity of the impact of the pandemic has revealed that we don't, we don't have a good way of tracking long-term success. Do some surveys, but, uh, but this, this is a takeaway and I think an important one that will help us zero in on solutions. But the other thing is that, um, that smaller companies who have, uh, even if they're not, we think of small companies, a lot of times people think of startups. I don't think of startups as small business. Small, smaller businesses tend to be, um, most of them are in the second stage, they're past startup. And um, they either are happy being that size or they're trying to grow. But what is required in order to be in line for something like, for example, the Paycheck Protection Program 
is a relationship with a financial institution. Financial, uh, being able to produce financial records in a certain way that, um, that made the program inaccessible for uh, many businesses. And so a takeaway from, to me for that, and again, like, it's whatever impact that it had on the, on the general small business community, it was that much bigger for any business that was more at risk before. The, uh, and so black-owned businesses um, that, uh, that didn't have the, um, the financial projections, uh, in, in some cases, uh, tax returns in a certain order. You know, when, when the pandemic hit, we turned our entire operation at the Small Business Association of Michigan, which, by the way, is not the Small Business Administration of the United States federal government. <laughs> we do get a lot of their calls. Similar sounding name. <laughs> we do not have billions of dollars to, to give out. But as we, we turned ev all of us, including me, into just customer service and, uh, and just to talk through. And it was our mission that everybody who qualified for the Paycheck Protection Program get it. And um, if there was a surprise that came out of that, um, it was it was how, how normal it was to not have current financial uh, reports, uh, financial statements, and even in some cases, tax returns. And, uh, and so that's a takeaway from this in terms of wh where we go in the future is that access to the, to the, to the world of finance requires a certain level of, uh, of record keeping and sophistication in financial management. And if you don't have that, then that door's locked. Hiram, what are we seeing in Detroit? I, um, I, I think that I, we, I have a unique perspective because you know, owning a black newspaper company in the city of Detroit, um, we were partially charged with getting the information out to people. Um, to kind of piggyback a little bit on what Brian said, and this was not going to be my answer prior to his answer. Uh, <laughs> But the one thing I, f I found that was absolutely shocking was the lack of ability for black-owned businesses in Detroit um, to properly document their financial position, financial statements, uh, documentation, you know, incorporation papers. Um, all of these programs were, uh, you know, good, solid programs. Uh, but people had difficulty responding to them because of their lack of um, proper documentation. The other thing is that uh, it, it definitely highlighted all of the disparities that existed uh, before the pandemic. Uh, transportation, health care, um, access to technology, access to technology infrastructure, all of those things that you need in the midst that a small business needs uh, when your facility is closed down. It just kind of highlighted uh, and, and made even more intense just how, how handicapped a lot of these um, Detroit-based black-owned businesses are. Um, the third thing is that when I talk about minority business, you know, I'm talking about black-owned businesses. Uh, I think that when we start these conversations, they start off as a black discussion, and then they, it, it kind of becomes a BIPOC conversation, um, you know, people of color. And so I'm always very clear that from, you know, my perspective, uh, when you say minority-owned, I'm speaking from black-owned businesses. So um, that's our perspective. I run a black-owned newspaper. I wake up thinking about black people. I'm an advocate for black people. <laughs> I've been black for 56 years, you know, so that's, that's the perspective that I speak on, right? Um, and so I, I just, you know, there's a difference between talking about minority entrepreneurship and black entrepreneurship, and I'm sure some people would disagree, um, uh, but that, that's my per perspective. I also want to thank Shameless Plug, uh, Delta Dental, for sponsoring the Black Business Minute. Mm -hmm. which I started over a year ago. And one of the reasons why I started it is because I heard the statistic at that time was like 50% of black owned businesses would not survive the pandemic. And so every week I spotlight uh, two different businesses and we talk about the pandemic, the effects of the pandemic, financing, 
trying to get the, the loans and whatnot and grants. Um, and so it's been pretty shocking, um, you know, to yeah. hear some of the comments from these business owners. But a lot of them are pivoting and being innovative and going online. A lot of businesses weren't even online pre-pandemic. Mm. Um, so, Brian, I want to ask you this question in terms of that sense of urgency to invest in and lift up minority-owned businesses. Um, what are you seeing? Is there that sense of urgency? Um, I know it was there when the pandemic hit. Is it still there? Are people woke still, or are they drifting off to sleep again? Well, the good news is that banks have a lot of capital and a lot of money to, to, to lend. I think there's opportunity there still. Um, the, but it does seem like the sense of urgency to, to address disparities has, has trailed off. There, with with respect to the the pandemic, where we saw these the impacts and the um, and the and the gaps grow, and and the uh, survival rates of different types of businesses, um, highly dependent on where you started on day one as you went through this uh, process and trying to make it through to the end. We're at a point where the top line economic statistics mask a whole bunch of problems underneath them. The economic forces that drive the you know, the overall employment rates and the overall income growth, that, you know, those are all clearly going in, in the right direction. The problem is that it gives license for, peop for people that make important decisions to, to feel like, okay, we're back on track. But for, for regions, for certain regions in our state, for certain verticals within the economy, and especially for those that started off in a disadvantaged position, um, that recovery doesn't look like the top line economic statistics. And so I think it takes a, uh, a really intentional um, decision that you're not going to just rely on the fact that the unemployment rate has come down, that, um, that housing uh, market is hot, and that uh, our mainstays and, um, and manufacturing are um, have got more demand that they, they can possibly meet. The, the businesses, the smaller businesses, you know, they, the industries that were most negatively impacted by the pandemic also are the ones that are, uh, that are dominated by smaller companies. And that has, it really has created a, a scenario where the world is kind of moving on and, and leaving a lot of people behind. And I think if we're not careful and very direct and intentional about addressing the, those, those widening gaps that, that uh, occurred in the pandemic, that it won't be stronger in the future, it'll be, it'll be weaker. It seems like before we're kind of inching forward, making a little bit of progress, and all of a sudden, um, you know, the, the economy's off and running, and, um, and there, are, there are entire sectors, regions, and especially minority-owned businesses that are at risk of being left even further behind. Candace, do you agree that um, the sense of urgency is waned a bit? It is, unfortunately. And I think that we're back to where we were early, um, early on, at least in the, the tech economy, where people are kind of pushing mentorship. Um, and mentorship is great, right? Um, let's mentor this company, and eventually they'll be profitable. Um, and that is wonderful to have lots of great mentors. but. We're a very intelligent people, right? But we have a disparity in opportunity, and many of that is financial opportunity. Um, and so, you know, I'll give an example. I have a portfolio company in Detroit. They got a big order from a big box retailer, so think Walmart or Target. And it's three separate orders for a million dollars. It's on a net 90, so they're going to get paid 90 days after it hits the stores. How do we pay for that? It's a newer business, been, about, been around about three years, and they can't get financing. We've been to every single bank, and what do they offer? Mentorship. Wow. Mentorship <laughs> is not going to pay a purchase order to Target or Walmart or anyone else. And so until we can figure that out, there is no true sense of urgency. If they stood up and said to the world, kind of like after George Floyd's murder, or as the pandemic was going along and saying, hey, we want to help black-owned businesses, then do it. 
you have the capital. The finances are in order. I can guarantee you that. I invested. But we've got to fix that. And so it's definitely waned. And that's my example. And Hiram, since Candace mentioned access to capital, um, I know that's been a big issue for you. And I don't know if any of you heard the Black Business Minute on Monday when I interviewed Chris Jackson, <clears throat> uh, successful developer, Queen Lillian LLC, you know, doing developments around the city. And he says that access to capital is still a huge issue. What's going on with that, Hiram? Uh, I didn't hear the interview, but I've talked to Chris about this many times, and um, uh, I see Nicole Sherrard Freeman here. Um, uh, she's absolutely a supporter of uh, black developers. Um, but the conversation that we have in particular about access to capital as it relates to real estate developers um, is that the way that the banks are structured in terms of how you finance your deals. Most of the time, you have to do a personal guarantee on debt. Right. And most of us who are in the real estate game, we don't have the balance sheet necessary to personally guarantee 10, 15, 20 million dollars worth of debt. Uh, I see Rick DeVore here. Rick and I have talked about that once or twice before. Um, the other thing is it requires a sizable amount of equity. Uh, and typically our friends and family don't have a half a million dollars cash or two million dollars cash to invest equity um, in order to even secure the debt. So there are some very talented African-American developers in our town. We're starting to see many more of them. Um, very sophisticated approach. Uh, some really nice developments in places where they're needed. You know, black entrepreneurs are more likely to locate their business in a black neighborhood and hire black people. So it's really important that we, you know, um, uh, feed and nurture um, African American real estate developers and entrepreneurs because they're hiring black people. Uh, and so uh, that conversation we're having all over town. How do we secure um, the debt necessary to do these real estate projects without um, having a $20 million, $30 million personal guarantee. And once, once the project is identified, then we are often um, required to go find someone that does have that kind of balance sheet, and typically they are not black, and then it becomes a former black-owned real estate deal and now a developer that's working for a white developer, but the black developer is standing up there saying it's still my deal. You know, so um, that's happening, and, and, and there are ways that we're trying to work around that as well. But let, let me just say this before you ask your next question, Vicki. I think it's really important when we talk about the sense of urgency. If you can't develop a sense of urgency around black entrepreneurship in Detroit, where can you do it? Detroit is 80% black, and it's great. if our greatest asset is human capital, wouldn't it make sense from a business perspective to invest in the largest asset class in Detroit, African-American re residents? Um, that's the largest customer base. And when we talk about small businesses in Detroit, we're, we, we think we're talking about a hair salon or a restaurant. We're talking about suppliers. You know, Brian and, and Candace, we're talking about suppliers, right? We're talking about people who are providing, you know, technology solutions to DTE or landscaping services to Comerica. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a very complex conversation then, you know, let's give this small restaurant $5,000 um, and that'll solve all their problems. We're talking about reimagining how we support minority businesses. I was, I have an office in Atlanta and I was going down to Atlanta last Thursday. I was getting off of the train, I was going up the escalator and they have these huge video boards that welcome you into the city. Um, all black people in red Georgia, right? But I felt like I was coming home. I felt like that city was embracing uh, it's blackness, and they had doubled down and said, hey, this is one of our biggest assets 
And if you want to do business here, if you want to live here, we see you as one of us. In Detroit, I don't think you feel that way. You don't feel that, that 80% of the community um, is, wow. is, is also our greatest resource. And I think that if we can just as a region understand that this is where the biggest opportunity is. It's the lowest, the, you know, lowest income levels, a um, lot of land available, a lot of raw talent. Um, I know um, at Detroit at work and, and, and those folks um, are really struggle with people who are um, you know, less educated, all kinds of things, systemic things that go into developing a labor pool. But I just really think that, you know, the topic is high expectations, high, re high returns, investing in minor more minority entrepreneurship. If you develop a black owned business, it's a little more likely to set up in a black neighborhood and hire black people. So I think that if we can develop that culture, that sense of urgency, then we can see those returns. Long answer, but. All right, thank you, Hiram, for that. And Candace, you've been talking about the State Small Business Credit Initiative, which is a $10 billion, with a B, initiative. Talk about that and what difference you think that will make for small businesses. So, this, the, so SSBCI, the State Small Business Credit Initiative, has been around for a very long time. Um, but every time we have um, a downturn, economic downturn, um, we, we kind of reinvigorate that program and we put additional capital into it. Um, so around the time of the JOBS Act, we started putting money into new spaces like venture capital, CDFIs, you name it, there were several programs that are um, kind of encapsulated in there. Uh, this go round, um, the three caucuses, the tri-caucus, uh, got together and said, hey, the money didn't reach us last time. Um, let's, let's earmark 50% of these dollars for socially disadvantaged people, which we know what that means. It's just a lot of uh, people of color, folks in rural areas, um, black people are considered socially disadvantaged. So 50% of this, $5 billion, are gonna go to those programs. I've been speaking a lot about it because as I did research on where the dollars went for the JOBS Act, I noticed that it just went to my majority peers. I wanna say less than a half percent of any of the venture capital dollars went to a black-led venture firm. I know that as a fact. It is out there, it's public information. So obviously the Tri-Caucus saw that this was an issue and said, hey, we want to earmark it at a 50% rate. What I'm seeing right now is um, majority-led firms standing up new funds with a black managing partner or a white woman as a managing partner. And they're saying to the, everyone in the world, hey, when SSBCI comes out, we're going to stand up a fund and we're going to apply for it and we're gonna make certain this makes it to the right people. Now, I'm gonna give you a statistic. 98.7% of all assets managed in the United States are managed by a white male-led firm. That means that 1.3% of everything else, white women and everyone else, is managing the other portion. So you're telling me that we're going to give more money, more money, to white male-led firms, we can't do it because there's just no way we can fix the disparity. We cannot fix it for any of the programs, venture or otherwise. And so that's why we have to make certain that we let the Treasury know, that we let our Congress folks know, that we let senators know, that we let folks know at the state level. Because once it makes it to the state, because it's the state small business credit initiative, we have to make certain that it makes it to the right people. Every single state gives out dollars. And so these dollars will be distributed toward the end of this year, early next year. And we have to make certain we hold people accountable to where those dollars go. If the number is 50%, it needs to be 50%. We can't recut the pie and make certain we keep at this 98.7% number. We have to make certain that people that look like me, people that look like you, are able to get those dollars in. Because guess what? The people who got up this morning, you guys are the choir, right? And you know it. 
And so make certain that you let everybody else know what's happening with these dollars that are coming your way. And Brian, while we're seeing a lot of black owned businesses suffering through this pandemic, closing their doors, we're also seeing an explosion in small business startups. Um, what accounts for that? And do you think that the window of opportunity will close anytime soon? Well, th I think this is one of the, one of the few bright spots uh, out of this process is that so many people have turned to entrepreneurship. We see new business starts happening at a level that we have not seen in a long time. And that, not just a little higher, it's a lot higher for the last uh, about 18 months. And even into this year, this far from the pandemic, it's been pretty high. And it might seem a little counterintuitive. Why would you, you know, with all this uncertainty, why would you start a business? And, um, but it's not terribly unusual in down economic times. I think it's just the, uh, for somebody to turn to entrepreneurship because, well, all your other options are relatively worse than they were before. Maybe now is the best time to take a chance and to get in. So there is a window of opportunity the, uh, to, to support those who have, who have uh, taken the plunge to, to start a new business. And, and I think this is longer term that this is where the bigger opportunity lies. Because as Candace was, was talking about, how, you know, when you, when you set up and you, you, know, you set a percentage, then the marketplace is going to respond to that. They're going to figure out how do I got to operate to get at that. And the, and the more sophisticated the business was in the beginning, in terms of their ability to legally set things up to check all the boxes that they need for this program, uh, the more success they're going to have at getting at the at the money. And so it kind of defeats the the original purpose. And that's and so that while I think you still have to do that. That's about trying to figure out how do we, how do we, uh, how do we unlock the door to let more people in, and where you see, where I think you see the bigger impact is when you have somebody that they're not trying to, to get through the door that somebody uh, to the house that somebody else built. They're built. They're building their own house, and that's where I think entrepreneurship is is can be really powerful, and uh, and. And so this window that you'd, you'd, you'd asked about in terms of our opportunity right now, it's, um, you know, I'll just give you an example from, it's a, um, a good friend of mine that when I first met him, he was really struggling to, uh, to find work and uh, he had a, a traumatic brain injury and it affects his speech. So he, he has a, uh, a and he, he speaks pretty, pretty slow and um, people just assume certain things about him because of the way he speaks. And he could not get anybody to give him a shot at a job that had anything to do with what he wanted to do with his life. And so what, you know what he did? Started a business. Mm -hmm. Because he would hire himself even if nobody else would hire him. And then he just went out there to work. And, and, uh, and, and he's really turned, turned it into a, a successful venture. Now, he's, there's three of them, him and two employees. It's a very small business. But he's building something because he couldn't, all the other doors were locked. He couldn't get through them. And, uh, and he decided to build his own, his own house. And it was, it's just a really cool um, direction to go. And I think you have to plant those seeds. In the meantime, we have to do things where you kind of force, you know, you just force things to change at, at, in the places where they're already built. But over the long term, the success of those that are starting on the ground and, and, and uh, and just going for it, I think the more of those that are successful, that's what creates the opportunity for the, for the others. And that's where I think mentorship becomes more important too for the smaller, um, the smaller operations where, you're, where somebody approaches the traditional system and they, they understand sources and uses of, of cash, that somebody's helped them through how, you know, you've got an income statement and that's just arithmetic, but how does that, how does that, how do balance sheet changes affect your cash flow? When you're growing, it's a very dangerous time. Growing your business is extremely dangerous. The failure, the failure points go up uh, by multiples as you try to grow. And, uh, and so I think these are, the, these are the areas where in entrepreneurship, and I, I know I'm kind of, um, the better small businesses do, the better the Small Business Association does. I, you know, I, I, but I love, I, I love entrepreneurship, and I think that ultimately, when little companies become big companies, and when little companies that are owned by black people and little companies that are owned by women and little companies that are owned by people with disabilities, when they become big companies, 
we're not even, I mean, there's a, there's a built-in inclusion mindset, right? It's like Hiram was mentioning, a black-owned business is gonna, is gonna hire black people. It's not, you don't have to create incentives, like you don't have to set up a program, like it's just going to happen. And that's why I think entrepreneurship long-term is the answer. And before I ask the final question, um, audience, you have a chance to ask a question of the panelists. There should be cards on your table and just raise your hand once you uh, write down your uh, question and somebody will pick it up. Um, so the last question is, what's one thing that you're doing and one thing that business leaders, people in this room, other stakeholders can do to push the envelope to really assist these small businesses? Let's start with you, Hiram. I, um the first thing I want to say is, you know, Brian and I had a conversation and I asked him, I said, what is a small business? He said that the federal definition is one to 500 employees, right? I get that right. So a business that has 500 employees is vastly different than if you got five employees. It's a different mindset, different needs, different culture. Uh, so when we say small business, uh, you know, there are a lot of different discussions within that um, category. But there, there are two things that, that I frequently discuss when I'm speaking. Number one, there's a ton of conversation during the pandemic, and rightly so, about helping the very small businesses. There are a lot of programs where you can get $10,000, $20,000, $5,000, and uh, you know, the, the, the the reason was, you know, to keep your doors open, to um, maybe partially pay for some additional technology or what have you. Uh, but I think we're at a point now where we really need to focus on some of the larger small businesses, right? Giving those businesses the ability to have a runway to become a big black business, right? The, there's so much focus right now on 10, 20, 30 employee businesses, and again, rightly so. But there are a lot of businesses in Detroit that are black owned that have high potential. Uh, they have the ability to scale. And what are we doing for those businesses who have the ability to have multiple locations, um, higher number of employees? Um, so that's one thing. That, but within that discussion, the other thing that I'm doing is trying to have discussions with a lot of our corporations in southeastern Michigan. If you look at some of these companies, and we're doing this work now, we had those nine CEOs last year go down to City Hall with the mayor and Reverend Anthony and make these broad racial equity pledges. Let's revisit that and see where they are now. Let's see what we have done in this town. Let's see, number one, because the, 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 the commitments were very broad. Uh, and you know, if you look in the Michigan Chronicle last week, I think the paper is here this week, we kind of started that conversation with them. What did you say you were gonna do? And what did you actually do? And I think that moving forward, the, the question has been, what impact have you really made? Because it's one thing to give out $10,000 and $15,000, $20,000 to a small entrepreneur in the midst of a crisis, but what systems are we setting up to help ensure success with these black owned businesses. And you know, one of the questions that we were talking about earlier is what can the business, the larger business community do to assist small black owned businesses? I think we look at their boards and we look at their C-suite. And one of the things that we can do is report that out. Because I personally believe that a company that has strong black board members, strong members in their C-suites that are that are minority and black, they're going to have a voice in the boardroom is going to impact their supplier development base. Um, and it's going to impact their strategies on how they engage with the black community. So I, I, you ask me what I would be doing, what I am doing, those are the things that I'm trying to impact. Increasing the support for um, businesses that have high potential that are black owned that can hire more black people and locate in black neighborhoods and press these companies on putting more black people on your board and, and more black people in your C-suite. 
because that's where the decision making happens. Candace. Yeah, for us, we're, we're doing a few things. So I wear two hats. Um, I run a fund, um, and then I also started an accelerator for women and minority-led tech companies. Um, we stood one up in Detroit last year with the support of Delta Dental, and we're doing it in a way, and I, some people would say it's not scalable, but I spend a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with the founders we invest in. It is incredibly high touch. They text, they call, I'm at their home, they're at my home. There are 15 people on my team and we all do the same thing. And so we believe that we have to take a holistic approach to building small business, um, to building tech businesses, um, because it, it's gonna take a village to, to do some of these things. And so, so that's what we do. And I know we're running short on time, so I'm gonna shorten my answer. All right, bring it. Um, I'll, the only thing I'll add is that um, you know, we, it's, it's, hard, it's daunting, it's hard to, if you think about how we're gonna change the whole world. But it's, it's not really hard to change the world for someone. And, and I, if there's a, a takeaway from this that I think could really um, make, a, make a difference across, across the board is if we all just kind of looked in the space around us where we have a lot of influence and to be generous with the, with the contacts and the connections and the vouching and the, the um, um, to, to use that influence to, uh, to help create relationships. And I think relationships over time will, will make a big difference. And oftentimes the, uh, you know, the, the disparities are so big that when you're trying to think of like, what's the thing that we can do to make, make it better? And the answer is there's like millions of little things that have to happen. They're individual decisions that people are making every day. Uh, I think having, having the right people on the boards and in the right places is a great start. And, but if it's done as a, as a token, it won't make a difference. But if it's done with real empowerment, it can make an amazing difference because now you, you've, you've got a, a person who's got a different or an expanded space to, to make an influence in. But even if you don't have that place on a board or in the C-suite, uh, if, if we really do take the time, there are things that all of us can do to help a person get connected to the right institution, the right um, agency, the right uh, investor the, that, could, that could just bust it open for somebody. So I, that, that kind of on the ground, very local, and I tend to think local on these things, that uh, at a local level, that's something that if, if we were committed to doing it, it would make a difference. All right, that brings us to our first question from the audience. I've received feedback that minority investment programs are viewed as set-asides. How do we change that narrative? I mean, I'll, st I'll start. Um, as someone who takes investments from limited partners, from LPs, um, when I go and I ask them for money, I let them know <laughs> that they're, they're here for a return on their investment. Um, there is a lot of research out there um, and it's proven that your return on investment in a diverse team that has a diverse board, diverse C-suite, has a greater rate of return. It is an absolute fact. So we let folks know, yes, we invest in black people, we invest in women, we invest in folks from indigenous communities, those who have disabilities, and people from the LGBTQ community, but that is not philanthropy. That is you asking for a return on your investment. We are not social impact investors. I just happen to be a black woman who has a degree in economics and statistics. Just like my majority peers next to me, I'm an incredibly intelligent person. I'm going to give you a great return. And so it's about letting people know that this isn't poverty work. That is very important work to do. But when you are investing in a business, you are investing in someone's future. You are investing in families being grown. You are, you are investing in wealth creation for you and for that person. But you have to be really bold in those statements and let people know this isn't about anything other than a return. Well, I'll never know what it's like to be a black business owner for obvious reasons. I, um, I, I do, I'm raising a daughter with a disability and, um, and you have a, have a sense for how, you know, the the world was was literally constructed at a time when people like my daughter were institutionalized 
literally 100% of them. They were, they were put in prison for the rest of their life in a, in a place where they couldn't make any dis decisions for themselves. The world was made when they were locked away. And so now as you try to like, where's her place in the world? And so disability employment has been a, uh, a uh, just a, a passion of mine as I've just learned through my own experiences how, how uh, difficult it is in the world for, for a person with a disability. And um, while there's an open, there's an open mindedness toward the idea of disability employment and, and investing in companies that are led by people with disabilities, the um, people do view it as charity. And um, I, I must say that it's, uh, while I'll, I'll take any opportunity to, ad to advance the, the interests of people with disabilities in living the lives of their choosing. Um, when it's viewed as charity work, it, it really bothers me. And, and I would assume that it, I mean, based on what you just said, it's the same, you kind of feel the same way when it, if, if you look at like we're gonna be more inclusive and we're doing it out of the goodness of our heart, this is our social mi mission to do so, I just don't think it's sustainable. Because when time gets tough, it's not, it's not changing. You're not, you're not getting the, benef the full benefit if you look at it as charity. The real benefit is that you have people that are innovative and creative and determined and have perseverance because that's what they have to do to survive in the world because of the disadvantage that they're faced with. So they've had to figure that out over their whole lives. Now, you go talk to somebody who's making a decision at the top level of the company, you know, what innovation, determination, perseverance, creativity, sound like pretty good qualities for your, <laughs> for your team, right? And so it is not charity. And if we, can, if we can reject that notion, again, I, I don't want to, if somebody is, a, a, is willing to have the conversation because of a, you know, kind of a social mission cause, I think that we need to take full advantage of that and use that as an opportunity to educate a person on why it's not charity. And, and you're actually going to make money, make more money because you're going to be uh, more intelligent, intelligent about talking to the entire marketplace. That it's not, it, it's good business. All right. And we have um, some resources we want to put on the screen for you, um, some organizations that assist small businesses, and you can jot those down. Um, the next question, grants versus loans. This will make a huge difference. How do we increase grants? Hiram? How do we increase? So that's government because grants. banks and financial institutions aren't doing grants. But I want to mix those two questions because I think that I don't know a black business person that's not trying to be profitable. Right. Like it's, it's, if you are an entrepreneur and you are you know, making a payroll every week and you have, you know, you have employees, you're investing in capital, in equipment, uh, in technology, there's nothing philanthropic about that. You know, we're all trying to make a profit so that we can reinvest in our people, our businesses, and our communities. Um, that, that conversation disturbs me because that, that narrative is that if it's black, it's less than. And, you know, here come those black people again, and we're going to have to pay attention to them without seeing that an, a targeted investment is what it should be called and not a set aside. Again, and I want to make this point, black people who start a business, who grow a business, are more likely to locate their business in a black neighborhood and hire black people. And unfortunately, by definition, that means that they're going in underserved communities. Um, you know, I see Sonia May. She's building brand new homes on the North End. And I'm sure there was a social mission. It obviously is a social mission. Go into the North End, build brand new homes. And the question was, how much money do you have to make a year to buy a new home? And do those people live on the North End? And now these homes are selling well. People are moving into the community. And now the entire North End is going to be on fire as a result of risk takers who see that community as an advantage 
Um, let's go someplace where no one else is willing to go. Let's take a risk that no one else is willing to take. Uh, and, and that's what business is all about. It's not about uh, giving people a handout and not expecting a return. I've never uh, made an investment or received an investment without a hard conversation about return on investment. So that conversation, that, that really needs to be fleshed out because those of us who are black and in business, we're not looking for an advantage. We think that the, 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 the sophistication of our approach, our education, our experience, we, we feel like we already have an advantage if you give us an opportunity. So I, I know I didn't answer your question, but the whole conversation around um, uh, having corporations and investors give black people or minorities something without the expectation of return, that's not how entrepreneurship works and that's not how any black entrepreneur that I know now, will we accept a grant? I mean, who wouldn't, right? <laughs> um, but we, are, we, we build our businesses on uh, return on investment. And um, so I, 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 think that's, I think that's a really important narrative to change, that we are not looking for philanthropy. This question is for Candace. How can we all push it's a for a long question? I see it all on there. I know, right? How can we um, all push for a report out mandate so that all institutions must show how much of their investments are going to black, brown owned entities, public accountability mandates? Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a slow and steady slog um, <laughs> <laughs> to do that work. It's um, Look, me and my entire team, we go to the Hill and we talk. We go you know, to our state capital and we talk. We go to other state capitals and we talk. And so it's just a lot of conversations with staffers, with folks you know, at the, the government level to make change. Um, but any corporation, so you know, in, my, in the town that I live in, you know, P&G is there. And we hear it all the time, well, P&G said, or P&G is doing this. P&G is a sum of its parts and it's all of the people there. So if you can kind of slowly tick your way through an organization and talk to the people, you can kind of get to the heart of what's happening there and make slow and steady change. But I'm certain that folks have seen that um, the NASDAQ has a new rule that there, you have to diversify, diversify your board. Mm -hmm. And so that is slowly happening um, as folks hit their next board meeting and then report um, um, do their public reporting, they have to let everyone know who is that new person on your board. And so I'm certain some of you in here, Hiram, you may have gotten calls, I've gotten calls, trying to help people with board placements onto publicly traded boards. And so I think it's, it's happening right now. Now on the investment side, um, some folks will never report that without being forced. And I know that, um, you know, like Jesse Jackson, the Rainbow Push Coalition, they've been trying for years attempting to get big tech companies to, to talk more about it. And a lot of these shadow investments, um, there was a, an article I think in the Times or the Journal um, last week about shadow investments happening at Google and Apple and Twitter and kind of some of the other big tech companies that they now have to report it. And so I think we are seeing that shift happen. Whether or not we'll see demographic information right away, I'm not certain, but we'll definitely know what investments they are ha having happen. And I think it's just going to take some investigative journalism to figure out how to get our demographic information on the backside. We've got time for this final one and a short answer, Brian. Um, would SBAM support the repeal of Proposal Z of 2016? So the so-called Michigan Civil Rights Initiative, this would allow for targeted public dollars for women and minority small businesses. Yeah, and uh, that I can't take positions without my my board takes positions. I represent the positions the board takes. So it's not Brian Kelly's organization; it's small business organizations. But I will say that there are, even though that that um, uh, that constitutional limitation is in place, the um, that there are several ways that you can establish uh, criteria that achieve the same ends. 
So um, as, a, as a practical matter, if you look at the state's uh, DTMB, for example, when they um, geographically disadvantaged business entities that are located, it ends up being in rural areas and very urban areas that, that, uh, that qualify. And when, so you can, and that's perfectly legal under the, under the Constitution. So I, I would say that um, on the principle of it, that it's, it's still an important conversation to have, but you can still do what you gotta do, even with that in place. So I, what I'd say is anybody using that Constitution as an excuse is just making an excuse. All right, well, let's give it up for our panelists. Uh, great job, thank you for sharing your wisdom. And uh, everybody have a great rest of the conference.